it's my, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Ignacio Rodriguez Iturbe. Pontifical Academy of Sciences. Let me start just by tend to talk loud, so that's okay. <laughs> Uh, thanking uh, the Academy for the invitation and also my co-author is Paolo Dorico, University of California, Berkeley, a former student. I'm sorry, a former student with now a professor in Berkeley. And uh, my job here is to talk about sustainability in water resources. And I will try to pay an emphasis both in what the challenges are and uh, what are the scientific, uh, the, 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 the challenges both from the point of view of the consumption and the point of view of understanding really what's going on in this case. Uh, let's see. Oh, which one? There we go. The minister knows how to do it. Tell me. Okay. Okay. This is just to, to um, provide some terms of references. I will be distinguishing between two kinds of water, which is very usual and very common. Most of the people are familiar with that. One is blue water flows, and the other one are green water flows. And uh, blue water flows, uh, green water is the soil moisture in the unsaturated zone mainly and is used uh, by plants. Blue water is groundwater, rechargeable and non-rechargeable aquifers, and also surface water. Again, it's used by the plants uh, when you irrigate, uh, when you uh, do irrigation of land. After this difference, uh, let's go quickly over this. Um, the use of, of uh, the water consumption by human societies just focus in the second circle, I forget about the first one for time, is about 86% of the use of water is in agriculture, with, uh, well, 9.6, whatever, close to 10% in industrial, and a little bit in domestic type of thing. Those are gross numbers, but the fact is that agriculture is the great, great consumer of, uh, of, of water. And uh, this comes to, you see, our constant use of water, which sometimes, I mean, we all here in this room realize that, but many people do not, is the virtual water comes at both in food and in industrial goods. In agriculture, which utilizes, as I said before, near 86, over 80% 80 of global fresh water, uh, is embedded in all kinds of things when we produce agriculture. The population growth and economic development reinforce pressure on water resources at both local and global scales. Although it is, agriculture is a local scale, but the consumption and the problems are very much at a global scale. The special heterogeneity of the problem in water availability is a very acute one, and the increase in international trade can be good and can be bad. It can produce good things and it can produce very bad things too. I will be referring most of the time to the water in food type of thing, the virtual water in food, and this is something that we all have seen many times, is the con virtual water embedded in agricultural products, and it's just to remember you, you know, if you eat a beef, 100, 300 grams of beef, you are consuming, you know, average term, 4,500 liters of water, that's a lot of water, and uh, pork, uh, chicken is much less consumptive of water, and certainly Vegetables and fruits are much less so too. Uh, and this will have an importance later on in terms of diets and things like this. Now, the environmental impacts of the water withdrawals are of two kinds in general, macro speaking. One is the over pumping aquifers, rechargeable and non rechargeable. We are both over, over pumping them, and the latest estimations are between 20% and 33% of groundwater use is unsustainable. 
unsustainable meaning that in the case of confined aquifers, you know, they will be, they will be depleted. And in terms of rechargeable aquifers, the overpump is larger than the recharge of the aquifer, the natural recharge of the aquifer. The overuse of surface water resources is through dams or direct irrigation from, from, uh, from the rivers is uh, produces, among other things, loss of water, loss of aquatic habitat. In fact, the rate of species loss is five times larger than in other terrestrial ecosystems, in aquatic ecosystems, in terms of riparian vegetation or fishes or different type of species there. And there is an urgent, urgent need to maintain environmental flows. I will come back to that. Now, the water use for agriculture, which is the big, big thing in all this, about 86% of the global water is used for food production. The water crisis, many people maintain, is really a food crisis. Well, whatever you want to call it, is about finding solutions at the global scale to mitigate and prevent hunger. Around 20% of the global cultivated land is presently irrigated, but it contributes to about 40% of the global agricultural production. Nevertheless, most of the world use green water, which is rain-fed agriculture, which relies only on green water, and irrigated agriculture, of course, uses both green and blue water. The green water contributes about 70% of the water used for food. And in here, I want to make a parenthesis for the impact of climate change on the regional rainfall, because that's what green water is using. Uh, you know, it's, I th it's much the uncertainties on the impact of climate change on rainfall, which is directly linked to food production and so on, the uncertainties are much larger than in temperature. Uh, because of many reasons, we, uh, Professor Ramanathan, which is the world leader on this, could tell you about the parametrization of clouds, which is probably the key issue in there. But, uh, but um, these uncertainties are multidimensional too. So sometimes you see this reporting where you say the average rainfall will decrease so much and then the food production. I don't think there is much sense on that, to be honest, and I will be very frank about it. Vegetation responds to rainfall in a multidimensional manner. It's not the average rainfall, it's how frequently are the rainy days. That's a random variable. How much rain comes in a day, in a rainy day, that is a random variable. How much will the rainy season last if you're, or the, you know, suppose you have two seasons on. That's a random variable too. And, you know, plants are smart. I always, <laughs> when I teach the class in ecohydrology, it's, 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 I always tell the students, you know, suppose I give you a scholarship, well, you know, will be enough for you to live decently well. So fix the amount, but I won't tell you when the check will arrive and how much the change the check will have. That's what the plants face. And they do very, very well in handling that situation. In fact, that's a typical first problem in ecohydrology, and they say, and I manage, I give some numbers, this is going to be your salary, you're living in Princeton or whatever, in Texas, you know, manage your life. Manage your life means, you know, how much you're going to spend, how much you're going to save, because you don't know when will you be receiving the next check, and how much will it be. And I classify the students in trees and grasses, because they, they are, the typical Latin character will say, well, when I have a big check and it arrives, I will try to enjoy life. Those are typically grasses that pump transpiration like crazy because they don't have much root volume to, to store the water. You know, the other students are more Anglo-Saxon type of characters that will say, okay, 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 you know, I am a tree, you know, I will save, I will... Uh, now, two types of, of students will flung the test. One is the one that says, I will live like a pauper because I don't know. No, you had enough water on the average to live. Or the one that will say, I will to hell with it. I will live happily as long as I have this. That will also. Now, that management in there is function of values that we were talking before, of how you see life, how much risk are you going to have. But plants do a wonderful job 
in managing that, that situation. Now, climate change is going to impact all of those factors. You see, and really, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated problem. I will not go into it, but uh, you know, you have uh, soil moisture needs to be is, 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 is what drives the transpiration of the plants and therefore the biomass acquisition of the plants, photosynthesis. But soil moisture depends, is driven by an input which is completely random and its arrival in the amounts of how long will it last during the season. And that soil moisture is linked there to a variation in time of the biomass. Biomass is very much linked. So both, you have at least two equations or two, two dynamics there, very much linked, and both are stochastic. So, so you have a system there. Jargon will be a system of differential equation. Now, to, it can be solved. In some conditions, it can be solved. And, but the essential point for me here is to transmit the idea that the solution is not one value. The solution is a probability distribution that tells you how it is, what, you know, how is the biomass going to be in the face of a, a, you know, a stochastic driver, which is the rainfall. And that assuming that the temperature is fixed at a summit scenario which controls the transpiration machine in the equations. So this, this so if, if I were a policymaker, which I am not, <laughs> I would like to see that uncertainty reflects on, reflected on that. I will not be happy just to, to, you know, to, uh, to, 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 to deal with the average values. My decision will change very, very much when I see the distribution of the biomass at the future. Now, this is a challenge, scientific challenge, which is taking a lot of attention now. There were recent papers in PNAS dealing with that. And in fact, attacking, uh, 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 applying the, the framework to, to northern China, where very, very good data was, uh, was, uh, was being collected in terms of the variation of biomass, of plant biomass, I'm sorry. Then you, have, you can divide the plant biomass, whatever you want, your woody biomass, leaf biomass, uh, seeds, etc. But that is the essence of the problem. And that probability distribution reflects the uncertainty that is embedded in the thing. There is, there is no way to get out of it. There is no way to give a value and say, okay, I can tell you the mean, but the mean may not, much more, may, you know, may not mean much at all in a situation of high uncertainty. And, uh, you know, my, my comment here will be that, that in the future, a lot of research is going to be taking place along these lines. It's already been advanced, but uh, more and more will be there. The environmental impacts of, of, of water withdrawal, let me go back here to my screen because I cannot see from here this. I don't have good eyes. Okay. It's the following. About 80% of the global water uses for food production, as I say. Okay. Now, let me go to the next one. This is a very rough map, the blue areas that's where heavy irrigation takes place. And the other ones are where most of the agriculture is rain fed. As you can see, the rain fed part is, is pardon, I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, which is, I have it in the river. Hey, great, thank you again. And uh, how important is the rain fed irrigation for pro food production in the world? Now, there is an unsustainable sustainable water use for irrigation. And uh, between 30 and 33 percent of groundwater use is unsustainable. This is a lot. This is one third. We are over exploiting aquifers. And 40 percent of surface water withdrawal for irrigations are unsustainable because they occur at the expense of minimum environmental flows. Restoring these environmental flows will entail a drop of at least near 5% in global food production. It is true in other areas, irrigated crop lands could expand for more than 50% of where they are right now, and that will have other problems too, environmental problems, and irrigation water increased by 50% without depleting environmental flows because they are very rich in water. This transforms the lack, the, the heterogeneity, special heterogeneity of the problem, transforms this in a global problem the need global cooperation through global water trade. 
Uh, I am sorry. Uh, no, the other way. I'm making a mess with this thing. There we go. Okay, we can do that. And just a parenthesis here for unsustainable water use uh, uh, for irrigation for the live livestock type of thing. Is this one? Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, this we already hay went through. No, but this is not connected to that. Okay. Livestock production. Thank you. There have been a strong change in the diets of sizable amounts of the population of the world. And uh, meat rich diets are very water expensive, as we saw in the, in the graph before. And, uh, you know, uh, by 2050, some authors conclude that the average per capita water consumption for food production will increase by 20% from the present level, mainly because of the change of diet, while population growth is expected to increase by 35%. The hydrologic impact is not that far from the demographic impact. And uh, here you see in this graph, oh, I will get it, the water footprint of major crops and animal products. And in there, of course, beef, oils, and oils type of crops are the largest ones in terms of water, uh, water footprint. Now, this in the water needs for, for food production, most of the future demand will come from developing countries. The estimation is that 10 years from now, developing countries will use 4,500 kilometers cube per year of green and blue water for food consumption. And that another 4,200, more or the same quantity, will be needed in 2030 for food consumption in these countries if we want to take them out of hunger. Now, water use for irrigation can sustainably increase only by roughly 500 cubic kilometers per year. There's a big difference in there from 4,500 to 500. Where are we going to get the rest of the water? The remaining world missing water will have to come from water conservation and efficient irrigation, biotechnology meaning more crop for crops, it's so-called blue revolution, which is still not quite here. The expansion of agricultural land, which could be something to consider, but have serious bad effects on biodiversity, habitat destruction, and CO2 emissions. And finally, global water share and trade and the reduction of consumption. Oops. Pathways to water saving then. Where is reduction? This was mentioned before. It is estimated that from farm to fork, waste accounts for 24% of the water use of food. That's a big percentage change in dietes with a manageable change, a savings of around 20% could be achieved. Integrated crop management could allow a saving of over 50% of blue water withdrawals. Improving crop suitability will have another 12%. And trade, current patterns of trade are, about, are saving about 10% of the water used for agriculture. But these values are increasing very fast. Now, as I said before, this is a global problem, okay? And this, in this graph, we see something which is not very different. Look at the lower part of the graph. It's only the trace of water between the, you know, the most intensive, the, the real graph is much more complex than this. It looks like an internet graph. And like the internet graph, there are nodes that are very important. In food production in the United States, is the Google, well, I was going to say the Google, really nowadays it's not Google anymore. In internet is, which is the thing that everybody's using now? Google and, I don't have it, so I don't use it. Facebook. 
Facebook displaced Google, much to my surprise, you know. Now, we know a lot about this particular graph in, in I mean, but, I mean, really not in a predictive manner. We know what is the distribution of, 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 of the, of the, of the, of the nodes, of the strength of the nodes, which is the power law, et cetera, et cetera. You know, network analysis and mathematical analysis of network is very advanced, and, but we, this is a very difficult problem, much more problem than, than the, in, more beautiful than the internet, because the hidden variables are not known. What drives the evolution of that is we really don't know. And what drives the evolution here is, for example, you see in this one, um, where the flows go, and is from North America to Asia and from South America to Asia, where most of the virtual water trade in agriculture takes place. Now, I'm running out of time and I want to, 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 to what, what really controls this, this, uh, this network, which is a very interesting field of research which is receiving more and more attention and it's very challenging are political forces and market forces. We don't know at this moment what will happen if we suppress one node. If we take, for example, Argentina out of circulation, how the node will redistribute itself. We don't know how to do that because we don't know what are the hidden variables controlling that. And not only that, you know, those are market forces. For example, Argentina right now, in terms of area harvested in uh, thousands of hectares, Soybeans is much more than wheat and maize, which are second and third combined. The quantity of production in thousands of tons is, or, uh, is twice in soybeans what wheat and, ma uh, and, and maize are combined. Some authors say that it's, it could become a monoculture type of thing. Why? Because there is a lot of demand, especially in China for soybeans, for reasons that we have discussed before, about, about uh, the know, for, for uh, to increase, uh, the, to mix with the feeding for animals, etc., because of the change of the diet. Uh, political forces, an example of, of, of how it impacts it, the global trade network, which is what makes this problem a global problem, that have to be tackled with a global vision. Uh, 35 years ago, more or less, Saudi Arabia decided for political reasons, it's just an example, that there were going to be self-sufficient in food. There is one aquifer there, and it's a confined aquifer. Resources, money, and energetic resources were infinite for practical purposes in Saudi Arabia. So they started that we are going to be self-sufficient in food. Sure, it was abandoned a few years ago. Why? Because First was extremely expensive. Second, the confined aquifer was being depleted completely. And third, it was much more expensive to produce that than just to buy outside. The reason that was being done was because being self-sufficient will provide, say, a strength against external kind of, po of political things. But you see, that's one example. Then right now, but that has another effect too, just to finish with this example. A land, uh, long-term land leasing, big extensions of that. In the case of Saudi Arabia, we went to the hill size of, hills, uh, hills of Ethiopia, and, uh, and there are large extensions there, where is a lot of agriculture going now, now, which is rented, the operation is rented to Saudi Arabia. So, in fact, if you look at the statistics of FAO, for the agriculture, I mean, a little bit confused because sometimes you say, my goodness, it's exporting food. Sporting food now because it comes from, from Ethiopia and before because it was against all hydrologic type of reason. So the globalization of water is, is, is truly an important thing to consider. It will receive more and more attention in my, in my, in, in, in my estimation. Make this a global problem. There are countries in, you know, in which you can do a lot of management. Israel is one example in which the use of water for agriculture has, has really attained levels of great, great, great finesse. On the other hand, you know, if you have to face it, the, the, the hydrology is not there to make it a full, you know, a, 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 to, to, to make it uh, self-sufficient in food for many, in many aspects. So countries have different vocations and uh, 
this globalization of trade can be used for great purpose to smooth out inequalities or can be used and sometimes what it produces even more inequalities than before because the one who has you know this the, whatever the thing the food or the land and the water in their hands can put conditions sometimes to other countries and that's an extremely dangerous thing thank that's you all. thank you so much uh, professor rodriguez iturbe uh, again we see the binary opposition between the logic of the market and the ethic of care and and charity questions uh, uh, yeah, first an applause <laughs>